My name is Cecil Cook, and I'm a member of the Terry College Alumni Board, and I co-chair the Terry Third Thursday program with my partner in crime, Diane Bloodworth. Diane, would you stand up? Thank you. I want to thank all of you for being here. If this is your first time to a Terry Third Thursday event, I also want to welcome you to the Terry Executive Education Center. This is our place in Buckhead where uh, anything that has to do with Terry goes on, so it's uh, where we congregate uh, our alum and where we hold all of our educational events. Um, we have some sponsors here that are very important to us. Um, our prime sponsor is the Bank of North Georgia, and I'd like to ask the Bank of North Georgia and their guests to stand up so we can recognize you, please. I know you're here because I talked to you. <laughs> <laughs> We're also supported by two media sponsors, Public Broadcasting of Atlanta and the Atlanta Business Chronicle. And I know you all are here, so would you please stand up so we could recognize you? <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> um, just a little bit on some programs coming forward next month. On July the 16th, we're looking forward to having Eric Zier here. I suspect we'll have a packed room because he'll probably want to talk about Georgia football, um, something near and dear to our hearts. Most of you know Eric was our starting quarterback from 91 to 94, and he broke most of Georgia's and most of the SEC passing and yardage records. Um, he joined the Georgia football radio broadcast team two years ago, so he may be thinking that he's coming to speak about something else, but we're going to have him talk about Georgia football. <laughs> On August the 20th, we have Tim Stack will be our guest. He's the president and CEO of Piedmont Healthcare, and he'll be talking about a topic that's uh, pretty timely, politics and health care. And then in September, we're honored to have David Radcliffe Come. David, as most of you know, is the chairman, president, CEO of the Southern Company, and I'm sure he's going to have a very lively topic to talk about. So you can register for any of these Terry Third Thursday events. You can go right on our website. It's easy to do. We, we, um, I was joking with some of the people in the, in the back of the room. We even let tech alumni come to these events. So <clears throat> anybody can come. Do we have any special announcements, Jill, or anyone in terms of? Good. So let me introduce our speaker this morning. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Robin Loudermilk. Robin is the president and CEO of Aaron's Incorporated. Uh, most of you probably know them as Aaron Rents, but they rebranded themselves as Aaron's Incorporated um, as a part of their whole new business strategy that Robin is putting in place. They have 1,500 company operated and franchise stores in the United States and Canada. Robin literally started at the ground in this company, um, and he's been in every division of the company. He started out as an assistant store manager, moved to store manager, then became a regional store manager and a regional vice president. Then they moved him over to the manufacturing side, where he served as a vice president of manufacturing. Then he moved over to the rental division, where he served as a vice president. And then he went over into the real estate division, um, and then the office furniture division before he took over as the chief operating officer and then moved from chief operating officer to, I think it was two years ago, you were elevated into the CEO role. So Robin clearly has started this business from the bottom, moved all the way through it. But before he joined the family business, he also gained some real estate experience, and I met one of your old colleagues from Colwell Banker and Stratton Construction Company. <clears throat> He's a native of Atlanta. He's a graduate of Lovett School, and he is a member of their Board of Trustees. He, uh, he went down the road to get his education. He's, uh, you can see from his tie that he's a Roll Tide guy, but that's okay. It just proves that all of us can overcome adversity in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Robin is the, uh, he is the chair of the Buckhead Alliance. And uh, that the Buckhead Alliance and, and Robin and the Loudermilk family have done phenomenal things for Buckhead, and I'm sure there might be some Q's and A's that come at you, Robin, um, in terms of that. He also serves as a trustee for the Skyland Trail, and he's a former member of the, of the YPO. And he's here this morning to talk to us about the family business as a community partner. So, Robin? Thank you, uh, Cecil. I, I I will pick up on the Alabama piece. This, this is a 
interesting, even though I think I'm a third generation Atlanta here, probably one of the, the few, um, I feel like I'm in enemy territory. Um, uh, I graduated in 82 from what I call Harvard of the South, which is the University of Alabama. <laughs> and interestingly enough, when I was asked if I had any slides or any video for this, I, all I could think of was a highlight film of last year's Alabama 2017 football season. <laughs> And I know that not many of y'all people in this room would like to see that because a lot of it had uh, uh, a lot of highlights were uh, some film taken up the road between a bunch of hedges up there, and that wouldn't be of interest. And, but if anybody's uh, interested, I'm sure I can get some copies sent down from uh, Alabama. But seriously, you know, I am no question one of the most fortunate people in the world today. Um, not only am I blessed with a healthy, active family that's involved, uh, three, a wife, three great children, two sisters, a mother, and a omnipresent father everywhere, but also being the CEO of a very successful family-controlled public company called Aaron's Inc. This year we did close to $3 billion in revenues. How I got to this point I think is interesting, but where I go from here, it is, I think, what I make of it. I'm a third-generation Loudermilk Atlantan. My grandfather was a fourth-grade educated Georgia Power lineman living right off Howell Mill Road. My father was raised there and attended Boys High, which is now the uh, Atlanta National School. Uh, I was uh, born on Roxborough Road, I mean right here, uh, behind Lenox Square. And coincidentally, my son, fourth generation, was born right off Hell Mill Road, not far from my father's birthplace. So we are literally ingrained in the Buckhead community, city of Atlanta, state of Georgia, However, I did attend the University of Alabama where my son is a rising sophomore. Roll Tide. Back to the story. <laughs> I am told it is common for sons to want to follow, you know, in their dad's footsteps. A few examples are the, the Manning brothers, Peyton, Eli, sons Archie, Kobe Bryant, the Lakers, dad played in the NBA, 121 big league baseball players whose father played in the majors, NASCAR's Dale Earnhardt and Dale Jr., Lee, Kyle, Adam, and Richard Petty, Bill and Bill France Jr., singers Hank and Hank Williams, and in the furniture, electronics, and appliances leasing world, of course, it's Charlie and yours truly, Robin Loudermilk. The Loudermilk family has leasing in their blood. Why sell something outright when you can lease it indefinitely? I grew up in Atlanta eating, living, and breathing errands. I literally was washing dishes at age 12 down on 14th Street. It paid for my education, housing, vacations. My dad's personality is the culture and personality of errands today, of which I am responsible for carrying into the future. Errands is not just a career for me, it is a family commitment. It is not only my family, but the families of the 12,000 associates, and further in the chain, the families that are our customers and the families of the people in the 1,600 communities uh, we touch through our Aaron's Community Outreach Program, ACORP for short, A-C-O-R-P. The Aaron's monthly leasing business model was founded on the principle of giving less fortunate, underserved individuals access the same brand name furnishings and products at the same pricing as the more fortunate or those with cash or readily available credit. This is not, however, a weekly rent-to-own transaction that a lot of people know, with pricing 30 to 40 percent higher. We feel it is a fair price for a fair product. This is a very unique concept of which Aaron's is the only company in existence with this monthly pay, no obligation program. I emphasize this because basic principles of this monthly lease ownership are a direct result of my father's childhood and early adulthood years. A kid whose family did not have an extra nickel for a Coke after a neighborhood stickball game using an old broom handle as a bat and electrical tape as a ball. He did not have indoor plumbing or a car and lived week to week, month to month. He survived the Great Depression and served in Navy during World War II. 
Through his upbringing, though, he developed a real compassion for his neighbors, the less fortunate, and a determination for he himself to be a success and give back to the community in which he was raised. Quoting Winston Churchill, you make a living by what you get. You make a life by what you give. This, I believe, is the foundation of our family business as a community partner. There are certain values we as family and a company stress every day. We evolve into who or what we will be remembered for. These include be fair with people. Appreciate your position in life. Always do the right thing. Know your customers. Be smart with money. And the two sayings I have continually been told by my father Ed, is you can't borrow yourself out of debt and watch your pennies and nickels and the dollars will take care of themselves. You must be active in your community and it will support you. Leaders in our Atlanta-based community who have lived by many of these principles include Robert, excuse me, Robert Woodruff of the Coca-Cola Company, Dan and Truett Cathy of Chick-fil-A, Bernie Marcus, Arthur Blank of the Home Depot. These leaders have no doubt given back unselfishly to their community, and their families and businesses have re been rewarded many, many times over. As Anne Frank once said, no one has ever become poor by giving. The success of Aaron's Inc. has no doubt benefited from the community involvement by both our family and the com company itself. To mention a few, outreach includes the Loudermilk Center in downtown Atlanta, home of the United Way and various civic and charitable events, the Loudermilk Center for Continued Education at UNC Chapel Hill, Andrew Young Statue and Park at the Andrew Young Boulevard downtown Atlanta, supporting the Atlanta Police Foundation, the Carnegie Library facade reconstruction on Peachtree Street downtown Atlanta, Jacob's Ladder Foster Homes in Piedmont College, Johnny Mize Fields and Museum at Piedmont College, YMCA Ball Fields in Coolidge, Georgia, near our factories, the Loudermilk Student Activity Center at the Lovett School, Andrew and Carolyn Young Endowed Scholarship at Breakthrough Atlanta, a program for underprivileged ch children, Warwick Dunn Foundation, Home for the Holidays. The list goes on to include hundreds of grants and donations through the Aaron's ACORP program, including $6.7 million in goods and services administered, administered through 1,600 stores in the U.S. and Canada. But perhaps the greatest ACORP endeavor to date, certainly in man hours, was our recent 2008 National Managers Meeting in Washington, D.C., where as a company we performed 5,600 hours of volunteer time and donated over a half a million dollars in product to the Wounded Warriors Project, benefited soldiers seriously injured in Iraq and Afghanistan. This included a 5K run to raise funds and awareness to the need of the Wounded Warriors, family picnic feeding over a thousand Wounded Warriors and their families, and the staff at Walter Reed Medical Center, Family Room, and Staff Lounge refurbishment at the Bethesda Naval Hospital, and the Hunter Holmes McGuire VA Medical Center, and many, many hours of cleanup and repair at the National Mall at the Washington Monument honoring our soldiers. Giving back is an important part of a sustainable family business as a community partner. It is neither a corporate department nor a corporate responsibility, but it is a privilege that shows character and kindness. It is something that everyone in the family, business, or large corporation needs to understand and appreciate. Companies have personalities and people treat them based on how they perceive them. It is the humanity that makes a business more than a mathematical equation designed to make money. We want to be, at Aaron's, one of the humane ones. That's my short speech. And I want to thank you, and I'll certainly open it up for questions. I'm sure we'll have some. We have microphones uh, for this to be recorded live. So if you have a question, raise your hand.
Good morning. Um, you've talked extensively about um, the opportunities and the obligations of operating within the context of a family-owned family -owned business. Right. What are the challenges specifically, especially as they relate from generation to generation? If you could talk about that, please. Well, you know, my, my father, coming from where he came from, with just nothing and really having this compassion, it's, it's you know, when, and I came through, certainly I didn't go through the Depression, I didn't go through World War II and this and the other. So I, I've actually had to experience and kind of learn over the years you know, what his thought process and ha where he comes from. Um, in our business, you know, there's a, there's a great um, opportunity to raise prices, if you will, because we only do it monthly. We're so much cheaper than the competitor. But if you raise prices, I feel, we feel, you price gouge and you don't make your product and services available to the people we're really trying to serve. I mean, we are a for-profit business, but on the other hand, we could certainly raise our prices and frankly take advantage of the underserved people that we serve because they really don't have other options. So there's a real temptation there. But you have to just keep your nose saying the mission is much bigger than the company. And we all know that and we feel that if we continue to think that with the mission being bigger than the company, the company will be much, much bigger over time because we are providing services that are just not available out there. Um, and where else can you go and get a new 42-inch LCD TV with no cash and no credit? You can go to Aaron's. And while we are a profitable company and do well, um, we have a real feeling of integrity. We have a real feeling of uh, good doing, goodwill when we, when we do this. The other people out there, and there's a real need for it, the weekly rent to own, much higher, and that customer is a little tougher to service and it demands a lot more service so that, the, that you have to charge a little more. We just didn't want to go there. Um, go back to a story, you know, the biggest, uh, one of the largest businesses I think around when my dad was growing up was the life insurance companies and they would come to his house every day and have a penny insurance policy every week and you give them a penny and you buy an insurance policy. You know, they could have gotten four, two pennies or three pennies, but they knew that they just needed to serve their community, get a penny, and look at where they are today, these life insurance companies. So, you know, there are, we feel that we are one of those companies that have an opportunity and also, through my father, an obligation to provide this service. Many, many people said it would never work because of the model, because it, everybody does weekly rent to own or retail. Nobody does monthly non-credit based. But the basic fundamental, the basic fundamental, the misconception is even though these people are down on their luck, down on their credit, have less cash or, or, or backup, they are still honest. Most of these people want to pay. And I think that's the fallacy in today's, all this no-doc loans, free money everywhere, they didn't do their homework. And look what's happened. We, we are growing 15 to 20 percent. Uh, we're gaining customers every week because of, I think, the integrity of our program. Yes, sir. I have a, I'm involved in commercial real estate and certainly aware of your project on uh, Peachtree in Buckhead, and it's been a, a focus of a lot of our attention who own property in the area. Right. And um, I just heard a, a talk by one of the executive officers with Cousins, he said sometimes it's better to be second and third on a project than be first. Right. So they were second, and they're glad they were, and they're just trying to figure out what the plan is. And I'm just curious, um, in light of the economy and what's going on in the upper-scale retail, what your plan is and what your commitment is to that project to bring it to fruition and to make it successful. Okay. Well, well first of all, let me tell you, that the project you see, the cranes and the concrete, that's not our project. We at one point own parcels of that land. We still own land surrounding it, and that's our strategy is wait, see what happens, and then develop around it. Uh, ben Carter, Carter Associates, or no, me, just ben, Car ben Carter Properties actually owns that property and his lenders, et cetera. Um, I look at that project and say, Ben Carter has done a tremendous favor for the city of Atlanta. We came in, a group that I was working with called the Buckhead Alliance and had the charge of cleaning up all the crime. You know, we had 12 murders. Nobody was in jail. 
Uh, to this date, nobody's gone to jail, over 12 murders. Um, we were successful in a pure private public partnership with the city of Atlanta, uh, with license and review under Barney's Hymn, <laughs> with closing down a lot of these operators who were simply there to, uh, they weren't open for business every day, they were just places where these gangs, literally gangs, uh, one of them notably called, you probably read in the paper, the Black Mafia family was operating, laundering big time prostitution and big time drugs through the, through the clubs and they had one thing in common which was a liquor license. When we took over the, the area and started and expanded the CID, there was 148 individual property owners. Every parcel was literally 30 by 100. You could not do anything with it, no parking. What Ben Carter has done today, even though the cranes have stopped, the glass is 60% full because he has consolidated those properties. He has gotten tracks, of, has gotten tracks of land that can be redeveloped either by him or someone. He has started the infrastructure improvements that needed, that had to happen, which was internal parking, centralized parking, and two or three rezoned to allow the centralized parking and he has put in tremendous infrastructure. Unfortunately, the economy turned. Uh, we are where we are. From what I understand, uh, from what I've heard by my work through the CID, trying to look at the sidewalks and get some of that back open, that he is scheduled to start moving again sometime July and August. But I just want to say, you know, we started buying land, tearing down buildings, and consolidating land. He stepped up to the plate. The only guy that I know that could have done it because large companies aren't as nimble and certainly wouldn't have paid what he paid and, and gone through what he went through. So my hat is off to him in a big way because he has certainly taken what we started and gone to the next level. It will happen. You know, it, you know it, all these projects, second, third, however it happens, a lot of them have done it. My guess is he'll be there. They'll reposition it. Some parcels will be you know, divided off. Some of the projects they've announced won't happen. I mean, just the vertical stuff's going to be a couple of years. But... Look, you know, from crimes down 30%, we don't have the 12 murders, the prostitution. We still have a little bit of the drugs and all that. And I think a lot of it's moved on. And there are a lot of people in jail. Um, so it's a positive positive. I look at it as a huge positive, even though the cranes have stopped. And, I, and I'm, I'm very confident that it will get finished in some, some shape or form. It has to. If you look, and just one last comment, if you look at the Buckhead Village, I was talking to Charles Brewer one time, with, and he came in to talk about it early on. He said, you know, the Buckhead Village is a very interesting place. He says, most of the times when you go and redevelop an area, you redevelop and you kind of wall out your surroundings. You know, if you look at East Lake and stuff like that because of the crime and this, that, and the other. Buckhead is just the opposite. You got huge positive financial pressure. The core of the watermelon just got rotten. So when you redo the core. You see the St. Regis coming in, North Face coming in. You see all the things that, and there are a lot more that are happening today behind the scenes um, that haven't been announced, won't be announced for a year just because of the uncertainty in the economy. But you know, ben, Ben's my hero, and I, and, I, uh, and I really appreciate what he's done, and I'm, I feel confident he'll be successful in some sort or form. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. McCain. Trail. Yes. Explain a little to those of us who keep hearing the word about Skyland, what they do, what your involvement is, uh, and then also couple that with the Roxy Theater, or what's going to happen on that. Okay. Well, Tim McCain was my elementary school teacher. I'm not going to date him or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> thanks for the question. Um, you know, Skyland Trail is interesting to me. It's a good friend of mine, Mark West, West family started. And I'll have to go back and tell you, through my history at, Aaron, at Aaron's, part of the business is collections. And it's a tough, tough business. Going in Saturday morning, taking TVs away from kids, going in and taking beds, chasing people at midnight, one, two o'clock in the morning. And I did that for 14 years. I was the repo man. My claim to fame was I knew every major airport and every major housing project in the United States. And it was pretty true. Unfortunately, through that 12 years that I did it, I burned myself out. And I woke up one night, passed out, went into a anxiety and depression. And I know you've read about people that have done that. Piedmont Hospital, thought I was having a heart attack, this, that, and the other. Long story short, had to take about a year, year and a half off. My father was very nice, very generous, kept me on the payroll, um, and 
benefits, this, that, and the other. I had a family, two young kids. So I know depression. I know anxiety. Been there. It is a horrible, horrible thing. I was really, and I think you can probably relate to some of this, post-traumatic type stress. I mean, I saw two people killed. I saw more guns, more drugs, more abuse than you've ever seen in your life in these areas. Part of the business, we are going upscale in our business, but that's just, unfortunately, that's America. Um, my involvement in Skyland Sky Trail is simply that. I saw that Skyland Trail's mission really is one of the very few and is probably the pioneer in mental health. And when mental health kind of, as I say, came out, when you had Larry Gillerstadt and it was the uh, big commentator on TV that came and had a seminar, came open about depression, that it is a disease, it is something you can talk about. It's not, you have to, Tom Johnson, that you talk about, you know, behind, lock you away. And, and um, So Skyland Trail is, is really um, something that I, I see, uh, I can identify with, I can identify with every person that walks in that door. I've been there. Um, fortunately, I've come out of it because I always had the faith. There is a reason for what I'm going through. I have that faith. And I think the reason is, you know, where I am today. And frankly, back to your question, those thugs in Buckhead, those guys with the guns and drugs, and now let me tell you something. We had the Hispanics. We had the Asians. We had the white male uh, and female attorneys in Chicago. We had the Hells Angels. We had the African American. We, we had every food group. It was not just one group. But through my work with collections and all the things that I went through, they just didn't scare me. And people called me crazy, and people said I need to watch out, and I, I did hear that I didn't need to, but because they were organized gangs and they do kill people. But, you know, I, I think, kind of getting off the subject, my work, what happened to me, Skyland, not Sky Trail, but the issues I had really set me up for where I am today. I understand. And I, I think that was fate. That's what happened. With the Roxy Theater, um, interesting. You know, again, my dad, he used to go there as a kid to see movie shows. I used to go to the Buckhead Cinema where they showed the dirty shows, but uh, down the street. <laughs> used to sneak in the back door. We went to different theaters, different times, but that's okay. Um, he and his cousins had at some point owned some of that real estate around. Um, and he bought the theater and has just this affinity to redo the theater as a central point of Buckhead. Uh, we need it. It's going to be a great project. We are currently talking to Peter Conlon with Live Nation, who does the concerts around. We're currently <laughs> talking to Live Nation, who has the House of Blues. We don't have an operator at this hour. We figured out we really need one. Um, but I think our intention is to make it a real central point for the Buckhead Village community for both concerts, meetings, things like this, events, um, and I, it, it will happen. So I think it's going to be a real driver, especially with what happened today. Coincidentally, we, we just were able to honor my dad, my father, by naming the Triangle Park there in Buckhead. It used, uh, Woodruff gave the money to acquire the land and create the park. They wanted to stay anonymous. It was called Triangle Park. We were successful in having it renamed Charlie Loudermilk Park. But what we're going to do there, it's all not about him, um, to his dismay. But anyway, uh, it's going to be the history of Buckhead. And everything that happens in Buckhead from the last 100 years or more, we, our intent is to have a plaque and a kind of a walk of the history of Buckhead. We're selling bricks to support the development of a redevelopment. It's all going to be... Uh, funded by raised funds, and everybody will have a chance to buy bricks, and then also all the uh, activities, all of the um, organizations and the people that have made Buckhead what it is in the last, you know, 100 years is going to be um, put there and uh, memorialized there, and then we'll have it where we can go future for the next 100 years, and we'll have areas where we can talk about the future there. So that all kind of plays into that, the Roxy Theater. Yes, sir? Robin, I'm just curious. Um, 
Aaron's has been a public company for over over 20 years. I'd like to get a little bit more um, insight into uh, your views of corporate governance, uh, and more specifically, uh, you know, working with your dad as well as Ken Butler and some of the others. Right. What is sort of the, the philosophy of of Aaron's? I went to a shareholder meeting of yours a couple of years ago, and I just was telling some of the people at the table it was the opposite of fireworks. Like you you go to some meetings and there are all kinds of protests and so forth. Right. And uh, and your dad was chairing the meeting, and, and it was essentially just it was almost like a love fest, yeah. you know, because the because the share price is doing so well. But uh, uh, but he seems to have a very open philosophy, no secrets, um, you know. Whereas other other companies, they seem to do things differently. Can you right. talk about the Aaron's philosophy and the dynamic uh, working with your dad and well, as vis a vis Ken Butler and some of the others? Right. Well, one thing you got to understand is. He controls all the voting stock. So you can stand up there and say what you want, but it ain't going to happen. So control, control, control. So that's why the meeting was so calm. You know? um, but other than that, you know, there is a, I mean, what I talked about in my very short speech is, is there is just, just the fundamental of giving back. It's just not about the business. It's about who you are and giving to the community. And, Everybody knows that. I mean, it's a tough, it's kind of interesting. It's a very tough business. And I always say, this is not a friends and family business. Most of the people in this room, if you asked me I want to do a franchise store, I would spend most of my time talking you out of it. Because you just don't want to be in the bars at 11, 12, 1, 4 in the morning collecting a TV or $35. It's just tough. Um, all that being said, the people that use our businesses really need it. The basic home furnishings, a bed, a refrigerator, a TV. I mean, they're going to be sleeping on the floor if they don't get it. So we've got to keep the prices low so they can afford it. And that's just the culture. Ken Butler, um, who is the president of the division, who's really kind of the marketing brain behind what has happened. My dad is the business sense, this and the other. He's the marketing brain. I'm still trying to figure out where I fit in. But he is from that cut of cloth. He's a great guy, but he grew up in the working class families. He understands the customers. He lives at his son's drive race cars. we have probably seen a little press about that, uh, sponsored by us and a public company. It's not too popular, but hey, it's part of it. Um, you know, you have to, we have employees that have been with us 30, 40 years. It's one of those businesses that when you get in it, and if you can make it past the store level and don't end up in Skyland Trail, um, you're there for life. You're gonna, you're gonna stick. And a lot of people, huge turnover. Um, but you know, you know, we went public in '82 because my dad wanted to buy a farm. You know, because that's all he'd ever, every nickel he'd ever had, he put back in the company. Literally every nickel. And so, you know, he had a liquidity. We've had three equity offerings. One of them was for a divorce. Another one was when he got remarried. So we needed cash for those two events. <laughs> those are liquidity events. Um, and the other was simply to raise money to grow. So, um, you know, we the company, I think what you can see is the company is really driven by his personal needs and desires of giving, supplying to underserved, but also, you know, while we are where we are today, I mean, which is just from an accounting side, you know, we have zero debt. We got a bunch of money on the balance, cash on the balance sheet, and um, we are in an absolute perfect position for the economy today. And we're gaining six to eight thousand customers a week right now. Um, about a million three customers on the books at any given time. So the model's just proven out. But the model of give to the community, help your customers. Be very conservative. Don't get overextended. Don't bar yourself out of debt. You can't do that. Um, it puts us where we are today, and we're. Don't get me wrong. I knock on wood every morning, um, but it's just been a very fortunate. I, like I said, I'm probably one of the most fortunate people in this world. Any other? Yes. Yeah, the, the question was how many stores we have in Canada and what is our expansion plans in Canada. We probably have... Canadian operation performing relative to Well, US. we probably have about 30, I'm guessing right now, 30 stores roughly in Canada. They're all franchise stores. Um, what we do is we, in a lot of areas like K-12, 
California, different markets, you know, we will go and let franchise stores open there because local management and all that, um, and let them learn how to do business. You know, franchise in a franchise system, we get 6% royalty fee. You know, when we open a store, it costs us about $600,000 per store cash out first year. We lose about $150,000. Um, I like the franchise program because I like to say I get 6% of the first dollar they lose. So we open franchise stores and go to, go to school on their um, um, education, if you will. In Canada, uh, it's certainly a, a franchise market at this point. I think we could have two or 300 stores up there. 90% of the Canadian population lives within 100 miles of the U.S. border, from what I'm told. Um, they do business a little different up there, just the employment laws and et cetera that, that I know all these lawyers know about. And so we're, we're testing the water. We're, we have some successful stores. We opened a fulfillment center up there. Just getting product across the Canadian border is taxes and government. There's a lot of regulations there. So we're learning. We do see it as a pretty good expansion area for us. And again, California, you know, we, if you look at our expansion where we are, we just follow the population. It's, you know, we follow Walmart. There's, how many stores can we have? 3,000 stores, 3,500 stores. Very complicated, there's 3,500 Walmarts out there. And so that's our real estate strategy, hit the ground, go find the Walmart, and put a store up. Um, but what do we do? We offer the big ticket items for the Walmart customer. The big ticket item for a Walmart customer is a refrigerator, a bedroom suit, and a TV and a washer dryer. Walmart doesn't carry those. If they did, the Walmart customer doesn't have the cash or the credit, I'm stereotyping here, afford those. So we just offer a non-credit based plan for the Walmart customer. That's our, that's our model. Um, but expansion across the U.S., we're at 1,600 stores. Uh, we should be at 2,000 in the next couple of years. We've got 3,000 franchise stores in the pipeline to be open that are sold. Match that with a couple hundred company stores will open the next year or two. We should be at 2,000. The next goal is 3,000. So we feel good about it. Yes, ma'am. I just have a quick comment, and sure. I want to thank you. Um, I, my avocation is riding a bike, right. one of those that you see on the road. <laughs> um, but you all sponsor a cycling team, right? and I'm not quite as fast as those guys. Neither am I. <laughs> but I wanted to publicly thank you for your commitment to exercise. And, of course, I'm a believer that exercise is very integral to mental health. And right. I'm a aerobics instructor and really believe in all that. But um, Well, thank you. I appreciate it. We just started a um, uh, health program in our company where you log on and, you know, log in if you walked your dog or you ran around the block or whatever you did, trying to get our employees. We have a, because of the nature of our employees, uh, it's a, sometimes it's hard to get a healthy atmosphere. So we're trying to encourage that healthy atmosphere. And I agree with you that it's, a, it's something you got to do, plus your health care costs would go down. So uh, thank you. And I think the CID that, that I, sit on here in Buckhead and, and, you know, really working on this area, getting bike passes. We expand the CID down Piedmont, down Peachtree to Brookwood, and all the new roads you see going in up through here. We're really working on live, work, play, walk, bike, the whole outdoors. So I agree. Well, thank you. Well, Ron. <laughs> Outstanding talk. As you can tell, I don't work for his company because I haven't been logging in and doing walks. <laughs> but we, we, Never too late. Never too late. We have a, a glass sculpture well, that you. we want to give you uh, so that you can always remember what it's like to speak in front of a highly educated group of people. <laughs> thank you. This is actually from a local artist named Paul Benzness. But uh, on behalf of Terry, thank you, and thank you for what you do for Atlanta. Thank you very much. One last comment I'll say. I'll I was going to make my joke about uh, I was going to bring a few cases of books from the University of Alabama yeah. from the athletes, and they'd sign those and might give them to the Georgia athletes. You know, so <laughs> seems like we have some extra books hanging around it up there. Get you in trouble. Get, get you in trouble. So anyway, thank y'all. Officially adjourned. Thank you for being here.